Kimberly Brayton Patel is going to give us our next uh, talk. And uh, she's a local uh, person. She grew up in Petaluma, um, played soccer against my daughter in high school. Uh, makes me feel real young. Um, <clears throat> and um, after going to UCLA, uh, decided that uh, maybe the law was a better way for her to go than medicine and went to Yale Law School. Uh, following that, she then saw the light and went to UCSF Medical School and then on to uh, uh, Texas Southwestern and, uh, and Stanford for uh, medicine at UCSF and then Texas Southwestern, Southwestern and then Stanford and uh, somewhere in there met her husband and, uh, <laughs> and fortunately came to us last year. So she's going to talk to us about the newer anticoagulation issues. Kimberly? Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to be talking about the oral anticoagulants and with a focus specifically on their use in non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And to give you an idea of the structure of the talk, I'll start um, with a few words of background, followed by a discussion of the uh, individual uh, agents that are available. Um, warfarin, the old trusty standby, and the newer oral anticoagulants, or NOACs, and talk about the data we have on the comparative efficacy and safety of warfarin versus the NOACs, as well as the, some common clinical scenarios that arise that can be a little bit challenging, particularly in the era of NOAC use, um, including monitoring of anticoagulation, managing of bleeding complications if they occur, periprocedural management, and the special clinical situation that comes up actually quite a lot of patients with um, atrial fibrillation and comorbid coronary disease. Um, and I'm going to spend a second talking about something that is actually not really a part of my talk, which is the initial decision about whether or not to anticoagulate. And I recognize that it can be a really fraught one um, for primary care providers and for cardiologists alike. And it's because all of the agents I'm going to talk about have the vice of their virtue and their efficacy in stroke prevention inevitably comes with an increased risk of bleeding. Um, but there are some tools that I like to frame the discussion with my patients um, with, and that's the chads vask calculator, uh, which my assume most of you are probably very familiar with, it gives you an annualized risk of stroke when you enter your, your patient's specific data. And there's also a newer, um, but I think very helpful, has bled calculator that is user-friendly and is very similar to the Chad's Vask in giving you a score that gives you, a, an, you know, an annual risk of, of bleeding complications on anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation. And I use those to help give my patients context for this decision. Um, but in the end, the decision to anticoagulate does depend a bit on something that is the focus of my talk, and that is what agents are available and your comfort in using them. And I would like to do a little bit of a thought experiment. You know, if we were able um, to choose the attributes of our, uh, our medicine, what are we looking for in an anticoagulant? And I would argue that you know, preferably it's an oral administration. Um, you want it to have a rapid onset. Offset's a little trickier because if it's, you, you, know, you want it to come off quickly in the event that your patient is bleeding, um, but having a little bit longer duration of action gives you more flexibility in terms of um, if there's missed doses. Uh, you want it to have a wide therapeutic range and a predictable therapeutic effect with fixed dosing so you're not in the situation of having to um, titrate the medicine. It's great if there's well-defined pharmacokinetics in renal and hepatic disease, and I would stress particularly in renal disease because there is so much comorbid kidney disease in our atrial fibrillation patients. If your patient is lucky enough to have normal renal function when you start the anticoagulation, you can bet that at some point in their clinical course um, they will not be so fortunate and it might affect your decisions around anticoagulation. Um, you would prefer that it have no food or drug-drug interactions, and that monitoring isn't required, but it's nice if it's available. For instance, in the event that you have treatment failure and your patient has a stroke in spite of being anticoagulated, and you wonder, is it because they weren't taking the medicine, or is it because in spite of it being on board, they um, had the event? It's preferable if it's easily reversible. And for the sake of the individual patient, as well as the healthcare system, given the burden of atrial fibrillation, you really would prefer it to be cost-effective. Now, I will take a second discussing the hemostatic system um, in order to understand how these agents are working. And as you might recall, the coagulation cascade um, starts uh, when the intrinsic or the extrinsic pathway is activated. And in the context of atrial fibrillation, that happens um, when there's stasis of blood in the atria. 
and proceeds through a series of um, activation of, of the various factors until finally it culminates in the formation of the fibrin clot. And the factors of particular interest to us because they are the target of the agents we'll talk about are factor seven, factor 10, and factor two. So to elaborate on that slightly, warfarin targets factor seven, dabigatran is our factor two inhibitor, and the, these three agents, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban, are all target factor 10A. So we'll start with warfarin, and the story actually starts in the 1920s, when cattle in the northern United States and Canada were started becoming afflicted with a rare disease characterized by fatal bleeding that would occur either spontaneously or with very minor injuries. And this prompted a lot of concern, and eventually moldy clover was identified as uh, being involved, and there was a hemorrhagic factor that was identified in the moldy clover that interfered with the activity of prothrombin. It took another 20 years before that factor was further characterized as 4-hydroxycoumarin, and at that time a rodenticide was developed, and sometime um, about 10 years after that, we find finally had uh, warfarin enter the market, and the name comes from the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation that did the, the research that isolated the factor, combined with the Aaron from Coumarin, because it's a Coumarin derivative. And it is still the most li widely used anticoagulant in the world, although, as we'll talk about in a bit, the practice patterns are changing, um, particularly in the context of non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And it was initially approved on the strength of data from approximately uh, 2,900 patients. And to, uh, to further elaborate on that, these are the six studies that formed the basis of the initial approval of, uh, of warfarin or Coumadin. And uh, they comprised 2,900 patients. And in the studies, warfarin was compared to, um, uh, to placebo for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation and commanded a quite substantial reduction in the risk of stroke. So, it's effective, um, but that is not to say that it's a, the ideal agent. And thinking back to that thought experiment that we did about the attributes of an ideal anticoagulant, you'll see that, and I'm sure all of you know from your personal experience, it misses on virtually every factor. Um, it has a narrow therapeutic range. It has a slow onset of action um, with an initial procoagulant period. It has a slow offset of action with a long duration and a long elimination half-life. It has multiple, multiple, multiple drug-drug interactions, more than 700 clinically relevant drug interactions. And what's worse is it has dietary interactions on top of that. Um, there's complex management because of all of these factors, and in, it requires its own healthcare infrastructure, which is costly and cumbersome. Um, and related to all of that complexity, it's not used as much as it ought to be um, because, and I, I'm sure you've all felt that, I've felt that, that sinking feeling that you, when you feel like this patient, you have to start them on warfarin and you're wondering how they're going to manage and how you're going to manage. Um, luckily, some new agents have entered the market over the last five years and have really um, opened up the, op the opportunity to treat more patients with, with a greater ease. Uh, so, in 2009, Dabigatran uh, entered the market after publication of the RELY trial. About a year later, Rivaroxaban um, was entered the scene with a rocket AF study, followed by Apixaban in the Aristotle trial in 2011, and most recently, Adoxaban um, in the ENGAGE study. And this chart just kind of summarizes what I think are some of the salient features to be aware of that um, among these agents with, and they're sort of listed in the order, they were approved with the Bigatran in the far column, Rivaroxaban in the second column, Apixaban, and then Adoxaban. And in case you guys are more familiar with their trade names, it's Pradaxa, Xarelto, Eliquis, and Savesa. Um, the phase two trials we were just discussed is listed on this next line. And the mechanism of action, as, we, as I touched upon, uh, Dibigatran is the only factor two inhibitor. Uh, the, all three of the rest of them are factor 10A inhibitors. Um, the study dosing, the only comment I would make is that the primary endpoint in the pivotal study for each was done on the high dose of the agent. Um, Half-lives are similar among the agents. Uh, renal elimination is, um, I think, a really key difference between them, with dabigatran having the most renal clearance at 85%, and apixaban having the least renal clearance at 27%, and rivaroxaban and adoxaban sort of in the muddy middle here at 66 and 50 some percent. Uh, the time to maximal inhibition for all of these is very attractive. It's on the order of hours. 
And the potential for drug-drug interactions, while not perfect, is um, far better than with um, Coumadin or Warfarin. And uh, specifically, the things that you probably should worry the most about um, are concomitant use of strong inhibitors of uh, the P-glycoprotein system. Um, because that can uh, raise the levels, and so you might have more bleeding um, when those are on board um, for, for three of these agents. And uh, the strong inhibitors of the CYP3A4 system, specifically for rivaroxaban and apixaban, which again can increase the levels. Edoxaban, and this is something that kind of distinguishes this agent, um, does not have those liabilities, and in fact does not have a lot of clinically relevant drug-drug interactions. Now, just to take a second to contrast these agents with warfarin, um, the, the pieces I, most, I want to spend the most time focusing on are the half-life, which is um, very much longer for warfarin, and the time to maximal inhibition, which as we all know is a real problem, um, and it's on the order of days rather than hours for warfarin. So looking now at the comparative data um, about the efficacy and safety of the NOx versus warfarin, um, this meta-analysis, I think, is very helpful because it looks at the NOx as a class and compares them to uh, warfarin as published in 2014, and included the data from the four large randomized trials, and comprises then data from over 70,000 patients. And I, I highlight that because, as you'll recall, Coumadin was approved on the strength of 3,000 patients. And you know, I know we have 50 years of experience with Coumadin, which might increase our comfort level, um, but we have a lot of patient years of experience with the new agents. Um, and uh, in terms of the doses, as I mentioned, all of the primary endpoints in the pivotal trials were on the high doses of the study. So looking at the results in the meta-analysis for NOx versus warfarin for stroke or systemic embolic events, um, the, co the com combined data is at the very bottom, and you can see that the NOx are associated with a 20% relative risk reduction of the primary endpoint. Turning to major bleeding, uh, which is a uh, you know, major safety endpoint, um, this also favors the NOx, although it's not statistically significant. There's a 14% relative risk reduction associated with the use of NOx com compared to warfarin. Now, looking at secondary efficacy outcomes, um, and I would pause for a second to say that not all complications are created equal. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but I know I would trade a little GI bleeding, or maybe even a lot of GI bleeding for one intracranial hemorrhage. And I think most of our patients probably feel the same way. Um, and that's important because uh, the NOACs, as shown here, are associated with a decreased risk of hemorrhagic stroke um, compared to warfarin. And they also have a slight mortality benefit. Um, they're about, there's equipoise in terms of the risk of ischemic stroke, as well as the risk of MI. And another um, set of safety outcomes was uh, intracranial hemorrhage and GI bleeding. Intracranial hemorrhage, again, favors um, the NOx, whereas there's a slight um, decreased risk of GI bleeding associated with warfarin. Um, that's probably driven primarily by the data from the uh, studies with dibigatran and rivaroxaban, both of which are associated with higher GI bleeding rates than warfarin. So what do these data tell us about NOx versus warfarin? Well, I'd say that Above all else, they're very reassuring. Um, NOACs are associated with decreased stroke and systemic embolism. They decre have decreased intracranial uh, bleeding and hemorrhagic stroke, and they decrease all-cause mortality, um, if, you, if you believe the data. Caveats are that the absolute re risk reduction was fairly low. These are rare events, um, and so it was 20% relative risk reduction, but that translates into a few saved intracranial hemorrhages, um, for instance. Now, and this isn't real world data, so a lot of people said, well, that's all and well in the context of these pivotal trials where um, things were very closely controlled, but how will they perform in the real world? Um, and the good news is that we are ever acquiring more data on that front because um, there's so much registry data being collected. And registry data has its flaws. Um, you know, it can be messy and heterogeneous. Uh, but it's actually very helpful to when you want to get a sense of, of how things, um, how patients are behaving kind of in the wild on these agents. And you can look at comparative safety and efficacy. 
in big databases. And one such um, study was uh, published last year by Yao et al. And it looked at an insurance claims database um, to pull out um, the patients on NOx versus warfarin and look at outcomes. And it included data from over 76,000 patients. And the, the bottom line for each of the agents it actually didn't start look at adoxaban, which wasn't available. They didn't have enough data from um, patients on adoxaban at that point. Um, but for apixaban, um, she was shown to have lower stroke and bleeding risks. Um, Dabigatran had similar strokes, so similar efficacy, um, but lower bleeding risks, so arguably better safety. And ribaroxaban had similar efficacy and safety um, in this database comparison. So this is a bunch of the other registry data that's come out, and I will not go over all of it, um, but it, mostly I want to call your attention to, the, again, the, the sheer numbers of patients that are being treated and the data that we're accruing. And the bottom line is that in all of these registries, um, NOx performed the same or better than they had in the randomized trial. So the registry data is supporting what we saw in the, in the pivotal studies. And you might wonder then, uh, is this changing practice? And in fact, it is. Um, so the Gloria AF study was um, published earlier this year, and it looked at over 16,000 patients with new diagnoses of non-valvular atrial fibrillation and looked at the practice pattern in terms of how they were being anticoagulated. And the first point I want to make um, is, is not uh, with, with regard to what they're being anticoagulated with, but rather this number, which is that almost 80% of patients are now being treated with oral anticoagulation. And I'll tell you that in the pre-NOAC era, that number was 30% that people were more often than not looking at the, I would assume, the complexity associated with warfarin and being like, ah, I don't know if they really need to be anticoagulated. Um, whereas now, um, the majority of patients are in fact being anticoagulated when they get diagnosed with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Um, and of those prescriptions, uh, the, the balance is tipped in uh, favor of NOACs, with them um, receiving 47.6 of um, the new prescriptions, whereas vitamin K antagonists only received 32.3%. And this, was a globe, this is a global, global data, although practice patterns in the US and Europe um, favor NOACs much more heavily than in um, some other countries. So now I would like to turn to clinical scenarios with a focus on the NOACs because there is complexity associated with their use um, that we've had to confront that's different than anticoagulation with warfarin. And um, to start with it is the issue around monitoring of anticoagulation. With warfarin, it's really straightforward. You can check an INR and be reasonably sure about exactly how anticoagulated the patient is. And that's not exactly true for any of the new agents. With the Bigatran, there are two assays that you can use um, that give you information about whether there is um, therapeutic drug level on board, um, the diluted thrombin time and the APTT. Um, and, but their utility is, is sort of only in, this, in a, a specific context of if a patient comes in bleeding and you want to know, is there you know, significant amount of dabigatran on board that it could possibly be contributing to the bleeding, you can use these assays. But you can't really tit you can't titrate treatment to them. They're not that um, sensitive or specific, and they don't offer that kind of granularity of information. And similarly, for rivaroxaban, adoxaban, and apixaban, which are the factor 10A inhibitors, you can use the chromogenic anti-factor 10A level um, to, to give you a sense of the degree of anticoagulation of the patient. What you can't use is PT, PTT, or, or INR, because while these may be prolonged with use of the agents, um, it predicts neither the propensity to bleed nor the efficacy of the agent. So that can be very misleading. So the next thing I want to talk about is in the event that there is bleeding, um, what kind of what do you do? And there was this expert statement put out by the ACC that provides an algorithm about what to do when somebody comes in bleeding and um, they're on a NOAC. And um, some of it's you know, very common sense. You want to know when the last time they took the agent is and what agent they took. Um, it's helpful to know, especially as we talked about for some of the agents that we know have drug-drug interactions around P-glycoprotein um, inhibitors or CYP3A and 4 inhibitors, it's helpful to know if they have any relevant exposure to the drugs that it will have that interaction. Um, and you want to assess their renal function, especially in the, uh, the context of dabigatran use, uh, as well as the severity of the bleeding and where they're bleeding from. And the next question is the most important one, and, and that's whether they're hemodynamically stable. If they are, you can kind of relax. Maybe you're going to check a factor 10A um, or the, um, the diluted thrombentine to get a sense of how much um, dabigatran or other agent is on board um, and how much you have to worry about them continuing to bleed. 
Um, you, uh, something that's interesting is you want to promote diuresis in any, for any of these agents. You want to be promoting diuresis because all of them have some level of renal clearance. And so the more their kidneys are seeing and, and diuresing, the more, you're gonna, the more quickly you're going to get these agents off board. Um, if they're not hemodynamically stable, of course, the, the usual principles of volume resuscitation will apply. Um, but in addition, for uh, you can consider use of activated charcoal, specifically for dibigatran or apixaban, and especially if it's two to six hours after the medication was ingested. Um, and for, uh, for dibigatran, you can consider dialysis. And if the patient gains clinical stability with supportive care, then again, you can sit back and wait for the drugs to wear off. If they do not, then we're in the situation where we have to be considering whether or not we can reverse the, the agent. With warfarin, it's fairly straightforward, and we've been doing it for 50 years. We can give vitamin K, um, we can give FFP, we can give PCC or Factor 7A, and all of those will be an, uh, effective and, some, and have their, their benefits and risks. Um, for dibigatran, there is a, a, an FDA-approved monoclonal antibody that's an antidote. Um, called, it's itirizizumab, and uh, if it's available at your hospital, it's an option. Um, alternatively, if it's not available, there's hemodialysis or activated charcoal soon after ingestion, and as well as use of PCC. For rivaroxaban, adoxaban, and apixaban, um, the factor 10A inhibitors, there is not yet an approved drug-specific reversal agent, so you're left with those more general factors such as uh, four-factor PCC or, or FFP, and there's not a lot of clinical data yet uh, to support um, their efficacy. There's mostly preclinical data as well as sort of uncontrolled human trials. There is, however, agents in development. The one furthest along is andexanin alpha, and there is uh, seroparentog, um, which I'll spend a second. Oh, boy, you can't really see that, huh? Strangely. Um, so <laughs> this, essentially, this just goes through and um, suggests that for um, iterucizumab, which is the monoclonal ant antibody that reverses dibigatran, the things to know are that it's well tolerated and it's already available. Um, for andexanin alpha, um, it is a specific factor 10A reversal agent. It competes with factor 10A um, for binding, uh, inhibitors for binding. And it's very well tolerated, no known adverse effects, um, and no known prothrombotic pro -thro effects for either agent that I've um, discussed. Um, and it's in late stage development, so it should be available um, on, in the foreseeable future. And the last agent, seroparentog, is um, very early in development. It's kind of the holy grail because it's a universal antidote. It can reverse any of these, no X. Um, it's only adverse effects that have been identified are um, dyscusia and facial flushing. Um, so it's fairly well tolerated. It does not have any known prothrombotic effect that's been um, yet identified. So, in terms of who to use reversal agents on, it, so as that initial chart kind of suggested, it's the patients that um, continue to be hemodynamically unstable in, in spite of fear of resuscitation measures, um, or those who are having life-threatening bleeding into a closed space like the brain or the pericardium, um, or those who are at high risk of bleeding, perhaps because they need urgent or emergent surgery. So, fine, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is periprocedural management, and this can be challenging due to the lack of data from large randomized studies, um, but in general, uh, if cessation is necessary, the timing depends on some um, factors specific uh, to the agent, such as the, the agent's half-life, um, the procedure, and specifically how much bleeding is anticipated, is it a low, moderate, or um, high bleeding risk procedure, and um, the, the patient in terms of, for instance, their renal function. But in for rules of thumb, if it's a low bleeding risk surgery, they may generally be performed on therapeutic anticoagulation, provided the operator is willing to do it. Um, for moderate bleeding risk procedures, for instance, cardiac catheterization, um, we advise stopping 24 to 48 hours before the procedure. For high bleeding risk procedures, I stop 48 to 72 hours prior to the procedure. Um, and you, these, these are sort of general rules of thumb, but they can, you should extend the time period for patients with low creatinine clearance um, or in the context of um, impending major surgery, spinal puncture or placement of spinal or epidural catheters or ports. Post-operative management in terms of when to restart the agents um, is driven by the, the surgeon, and it depends on um, the post-operative risk of bleeding as well as the uh, achievement of adequate hemostasis at the end of surgery. So the last clinical scenario that comes up a lot in cardiology is when patients have coronary disease and have atrial fibrillation. 
And, um, oh boy, that's too bad. But, so we know that warfarin is very, um, is, is similar to aspirin in terms of its um, efficacy and secondary prevention. So at least in my practice, if a patient has stable coronary disease, I don't leave them on aspirin and warfarin. I, I let warfarin do the work of both um, to minimize the risk of bleeding. And long term, they can just stay on warfarin. Um, and the question is whether we can do the same with NOACs. Um, and it matters because we know from registry data that the combination of aspirin and NOACs leads to um, markedly more bleeding complications. So if you can just use NOACs, you should. And I think you can. And you're going to sort of have to trust me because I don't think you can see the slide. Um, but this, um, but so one way to look at the, get at this question was looking at the results from the pivotal trials. And in those patients that had a significant burden of coronary disease in each of the studies, um, they, they, one of the secondary analyses looked at um, re repeat MI, um, and it turned out for patients that were randomized to warfarin for, and for those on randomized to NOACs, um, this, it was about the same. And if anything, it favored the, um, the, the um, NOACs, with the exception of the only one you can see, which is dabigatran, the factor II inhibitor. Um, where it was a little bit more, it looked like it might favor warfarin, but certainly for patients who are going to be on a factor 10A inhibitor, um, I would take from this data to have the suggestion that, you, that if you trust that warfarin is good enough for secondary prevention, which I do, then you should trust that the NOACs are good enough and not run the risk of bleeding by leaving aspirin on board on top of NOACs for most patients with stable coronary disease. Harder question is around uh, PCI, um, either for stable coronary disease or that has become unstable in the sense of um, patients with progressive angina or something that go undergo the elective PCI um, or in patients who have an acute coronary syndrome. And this is uh, borrowed from the European Society of Cardiology Practice Guide, but I think it's actually a, a very coherent way to think about it. And I generally agree with one exception. Um, and that is to say that they would say that um, after elective PCI with a drug-eluting stent, which is almost invariably what people get at this point, um, they, they would recommend one month of triple therapy with a NOAC and aspirin and the um, P2Y12 inhibitor of your choice, followed by six, uh, followed by double therapy with a NOAC and um, another agent for out to a year. And this is the only place that I kind of differ. They say NOAC plus aspirin or the um, P2Y12 inhibitor, whereas I think that m m I and most of my colleagues would prefer that you choose the um, P2Y12 inhibitor and not aspirin for the double therapy out to a year. And then finally, that you transition to NOAC monotherapy at the point at which they're stable coronary disease. Um, for acute coronary syndromes, the ischemic risks are higher, and um, so that favors uh, triple therapy out to six months, and there's play there. If it's you know, left mean stenting, maybe you go longer, um, and if there's high bleeding risk, maybe you go shorter, um, but essentially that's triple therapy with a NOAC, aspirin, and the P2Y12 inhibitor out to six months, and then followed by another six months of double therapy and ultimately transition to NOAC monotherapy. So just to end, I was going to, I just wanted to use what we talked about to kind of frame a couple of ideas around um, the patient in front of you, how you put this together in terms of whether you prefer one agent or another. Um, so patients with compliance problems, maybe you still choose warfarin because you want to be able to monitor and it has a long elimination half-life. Um, or perhaps you choose rivaroxaban or adoxaban because it has once daily dosing. For patients with a history of GI bleeding, it's mostly a cautionary tale that perhaps you should avoid dabigatran or rivaroxaban in favor of a different agent since there are higher bleeding rates associated with those agents. If the patient has kidney dysfunction, you might choose apixaban. If it's really bad kidney dysfunction, you might choose warfarin because of the ability to monitor and to, and to titrate your dose. If you're focused on reversibility, warfarin and dabigatran both have uh, agent-specific reversal available. And if survival is your bottom line, then perhaps you choose a pixaban because that is the only one, and I didn't talk about this data, um, but that was shown to have a survival benefit in its head-to-head -head study against warfarin. So warfarin, however, is still the drug of choice in mechanical heart valves, in um, situations where a patient prefers warfarin, including where it's cost prohibitive for them to take a NOAC. Uh, patients with very poor renal function, as I mentioned, and perhaps in patients with questionable compliance or difficult, difficulty with compliance. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions.
I know that the focus of your talk was uh, cardiac use is atrial fibrillation. Are you willing to say anything about uh, DVTs and PEs? Actually, I'm so sorry. I'm not even seeing who's the speaker. Oh, thank you. I was thinking. Um, so, what, what, so. Do you have any the, comments about the Einstein Extend trial that was published this week in the New England Journal of Medicine about uh, <laughs> extending rivaraxaban longer versus uh, aspirin? I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable commenting on it because I haven't reviewed the data closely. Uh, I'm so sorry. sorry. Since these agents are so effective, shouldn't they be called YOAX rather than NOAX? <laughs> I'm totally going to change my talk. <laughs> Relative costs. Um, okay. Excuse me. Okay, sorry. <laughs> what are the relative costs of these new agents versus warfarin? What's it's going to cost? So, I don't, I don't know, but I think it depends a lot. Are you talking about the cost, out-of-pocket cost to the patient? Yeah, and a lot of that depends. There's no question it's more expensive, um, but a lot of it depends on their specific coverage. Um, but it's not, I mean, it's not insubstantial. I have patients all the time that tell me that they want to take these agents, but they're concerned that, especially at the end of the year when they're in that donut hole, that, that they just um, feel like they can't afford them. It's a real problem. Yes, yeah, sudden withdrawal of those new anticoagulants will increase uh, uh, clotting. And have anybody looked into a non-compliance? Would that be an issue or no? So you're, you're commenting that there's increased clotting associated with sudden withdrawal. Yeah. Is, um, that, is that true? I, I actually, I I'm not aware of that data. I think that you stop getting the benefit as it wears off. But I don't think there's a pro-coagulant effect that we've seen. Um, but if anybody knows differently, I'm happy to be corrected. But yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I think you just stop getting the benefit as they, as they wear off. Huh. Okay. I, I thought it was. All right. Thank you. Thank you.